Hey everyone, welcome back. So today we're gonna to be looking at coding word to vec So the best case scenario is you come here having watched the word to vec video that we made, or at least understand the idea of word to vec and then here we'll look at how to code it pretty simply. So I've written all the code out here and I won't spend time going into each and every little thing, but I'll talk about the high level parts of the code. And so here's the text that we're gonna be using in order to convert each of the words in this text into a vector in initially two dimensional space, but we'll see what happens when we increase the embedding size. So this text, you can go ahead and read it, it's kind of silly. I basically just put the words data, science, and statistics like many, many times in here just to make sure that word to vec picks up on all that and puts the words data, science, and statistics kind of close together in our two-dimensional space at the end of the day. And there's other parts in here that are interesting too, like we have the words machine learning and artificial intelligence, other stuff showing up. So the first thing we do, as we talked about in the word to vec video, is that we're going to prepare our training data. And so that kind of consists of three steps. First, we eliminate all the stop words. So there's certain words in here like we and the that we'll just get rid of. The next step is we do the skip gram technique, which allows us to construct the data set. And then we introduce negative samples so that it learns what are context words and also what are not context words. And so for this video, we picked a window size of three so that when we're looking at a main word, we consider the context as three words before and three words after. And the number of negative samples is three, so that for each main word, we include three examples of things that are not in its context. And at the end of the day, we get a data set that looks like this. So it's 983 rows. That's how many samples we have. And each one is a central word, a context word, and whether or not those two things actually appear together within the window size in our body of text. So we have ones and zeros in here, which is nice. So next we'll take a look at some of the functions that we're going to use. So this is just a sigmoid function. This function called update embeddings is the one I'll spend the most time on because that's what's driving this process. This is pretty much one iteration of going through all of the examples in our training data and updating our vectors accordingly. So I've commented as best I can, but the first thing we do is we get the differences between the main embeddings and the corresponding context embeddings, one for one, looking at this data set here. The reason we need to get those differences is because once we figure out the scores and the errors, which is the next thing we do, we are going to update each of the main and context vectors in the direction of the difference between them. So if you have a main vector and you have a context vector and those two things should get closer, then we use the difference between them to basically bridge that gap a little bit on each iteration. All right, so the next thing we do is we get the dot products as we did in the whiteboard video. We get the scores as we did in the whiteboard video and we get the errors as well. And this is honestly the key line the rest of this is kind of not as important. But the key line is that the updates in this current step is the multiplication of the differences, the errors, and the learning rate. So let's talk about each one of these and see why this update makes sense. So the differences, what we talked about, is the difference between each pair of vectors. So we want to update in the direction of those differences to bridge gaps that should be bridged and make gaps wider that should be not close together. The errors is the magnitude of how aggressive we want to be. For example, if we have two vectors like this and the error between them is very large, then we want to bring them a lot closer together. If two vectors are already pretty close together, then we want to bring them just a little bit closer. So we're updating proportional to what the error currently is. And the learning rate is just a user-defined parameter. We'll be using point one in this video about how fast you want the algorithm to go. And then the other key line is here where we actually apply these updates. And that's basically end of the day. The only other caveat I'll say is that I didn't note this in the whiteboard video, but we are going to be doing this uh, step here where we normalize the embeddings at the end of each loop through all the data. Um, this is to avoid vectors getting way too large. So it's kind of a regularization technique where we bring all the vectors back into the unit sphere, unit circle, unit hypersphere, whatever dimensional space you're currently working in. And that's it, we're ready to just kind of see it at work. So we go ahead and run this driver code here. We're gonna start with an embedding size of two so we can actually talk about and visualize what's going on a lot easier. And then we go ahead and randomly initialize the main embeddings and the context embeddings. And then we just 25 times, we're gonna run the above function. So we're gonna do 25 passes through that data set. And on each pass, it's gonna bring things closer together that should be closer together and push things further apart that should be further apart. And we can visualize it here. So I've chosen to lock in on the words data and science. And let's kind of treat this as a story and see what happens to them as we go from iteration to iteration. So the left-hand plot is the two main vectors for data and science. Remember, the main vectors are the ones that we keep at the end of the day. And the right-hand plot, the red one here, is the main vector for data. And the blue one here is the context vector for science. 
So we can kind of go down this and look at what happens to the main vectors and also see what happens to a main vector and a context vector. So initially they're pretty far apart because they've been randomly initialized. So let's scroll down and see what happens to the story. We'll mainly just focus on this left hand plot here. So we can see they actually get a little bit further apart. This is while the algorithm's still kind of figuring out what's going on, getting past those random values. But pretty soon we see them start getting closer together. So we see now these similarities, the cosine similarity between them is actually increasing. Increasing, increasing, keeps going. And you see this magical thing happen where they become really close together and we're not even done yet. At the end of the day, it's effectively one. That's the similarity between them. And we can also print out what are the uh, similarities between data and the other words that are in our corpus. And we see that data and science have the highest similarity followed by data and statistics, also what we would expect, and then some other stuff that happened to be in the neighborhood of data. But this is totally what we would expect. We wanted data and science and data and statistics to be very close to each other. And that's exactly what we got. And then since we have these embeddings, we can just visualize all of them. So these are all of the embeddings, a little bit difficult to look at. So let's zoom in on the bottom right hand corner. And we see we have data, science, statistics, all close to each other in this little cloud over here. And then we can look at other interesting things too. Like we see we have machine and learning actually showing up together here. So it's doing a lot of the things that we would expect. So now let's increase the embedding size to five, which is still way lower than what it would really be. It would really be like 50 or 100 or 200, but just to kind of give all the vectors a little bit more freedom to move around in space and see what happens then. So we're gonna switch the embedding size to five. We're going to rerun these guys. This is going to take a little while. Let's just follow the progress. They're getting closer and closer and closer. The reason they're no longer on this unit circle is because we're actually living in five dimensions. So you have to kind of think of a five dimensional unit hypersphere, which I cannot. And then we get 0.98 at the end of the day. If we print out these guys, we see that data and statistics and data and science are still the top ones. And then if we visualize the embeddings, now to visualize them, we have to use principal component analysis because we can only plot in two dimensions but we see we get this cloud here. And we see, for example, we have artificial learning machine all in kind of a cloud here. We have, I believe, data and statistics and science are all kind of on top of each other here. Let's zoom in on that region. So let's say we want the X coordinate to be less than negative 0.25. And let's say we want the Y coordinate to be less than negative 0.4 and see what's going on there. We see we have science and statistics and data all pretty close to each other and studying is also in this cloud. So hopefully this gave you kind of a quick overview of how to code a word to vec. It's not that much code, honestly. Um, the main driver function was just that update embeddings function up there. So I'll make this code available to you. You can play around with it. You can put in your own text and just kind of see what happens. It's really fun to just play around with and see what happens. Um, so hopefully you learned about coding word to vec in this video. If you enjoyed it, please like and subscribe for more just like this and I'll see you next time.